When I saw the game was described as a horror adventure, I thought for sure I would be getting something like this. But instead, I got this. For someone that is faint of heart, I appreciate that this game didn't give me a heart attack at every passing minute. But if you're expecting this to be Junji Ito levels of scary and unsettling, then you'll definitely be disappointed. To me, it's less horror adventure and more of a historical crime drama with flavors of horror and mystery. Because the core essence of the game isn't about how badly it can terrify its players. Instead, it's about the unraveling of an age-old mystery that, at times, can be downright frightening. My name is Andre, and let's talk about Paranormasite, The Seven Mysteries of Hanjo. I've played a handful of visual novels over the course of my life. However, visual novels really aren't my thing. To me, they were always in that awkward middle ground between being an anime that you could watch or a manga that you could read. So then why am I here talking about a visual novel? Well, it all started back in August during Steam's 2023 Visual Novel Fest. One of the games they featured was Paranormasite, and after taking a quick glance at its Steam page, I decided to give it a shot. I mean, why not, right? The game was on sale, and if I ended up not liking it, then I'll just return it. And well, it's safe to say that it was a worthwhile purchase. I enjoyed the game a lot, and if you're an anime lover who happens to like horror-themed mysteries, then you definitely shouldn't miss out on Paranormasite. Now, before I talk more about what Paranormasite actually is, spoiler warning. From now on, I'll be showing footage as well as talking about the entirety of the game, so I suggest you not watch this video if you're planning on playing it. You've been warned. Paranormasite, The Seven Mysteries of Honjo is a visual novel developed and published by Square Enix. Set in 1980s Japan, you first follow Shogo, a dude who fits your stereotypical bland anime protagonist trope. In horror movie fashion, Shogo and his friend Yoko visit the infamously cursed Kinshibori Park in the dead of night. They're there in the hopes of uncovering the mystery behind a collection of urban legends called The Seven Mysteries of Honjo. Rumor has it that The Seven Mysteries of Honjo are linked to the Rite of Resurrection, in which someone can bring a person back from the dead. In the game's first scenes, Shogo witnesses Yoko's death at the hands of a curse. See, each of the seven mysteries of Honjo, though there are technically nine of them for some reason, are tied to a specific curse that originates from a location within the game. We learn that the people who receive a curse via a curse stone becomes what is known as a curse bearer. Only curse bearers can perform the rite of resurrection, and to do so, they must kill others with their curse, filling up their stones with the souls of their victims called soul dregs. Importantly, killing other curse bearers will net more soul dregs. That means that curse bearers are incentivized to kill each other in order to fulfill the rite of resurrection. This coincides with the fact that only one curse bearer can complete the rite. Now, if that doesn't scream battle royale to you, then I don't know what will because that's basically what the story turns into. What is interesting about the curse stones is that the power differs based on the curse. For example, Shogo receives the Whispering Canal. This gives him the power to curse someone to death whenever they turn their back on him and walk away. This adds an element of mind gaming and manipulation as curse bearers encounter each other, trying to fulfill their own curse's conditions and kill the other person before they get cursed themselves. I don't know about you, but this horror adventure just turned into a battle shown in anime, with people using curses to battle other people with curses. This was the point in the story when I, for the most part, got over being scared of the game. And this happens legit less than an hour into the game, by the way. Sure, there are a few jump scares throughout the game that still got me, but that's because I'm a scaredy cat through and through. But for now, the game has entered the territory of being over the top and borderline goofy. It's a narrative and stylistic twist that I would describe as being as anime as it gets. And I gotta say, I absolutely love it. If it wasn't already obvious, Shogo isn't the only character you play as in Paranormasite. The game features three other main characters who you actually spend the most time with in the game. 
First, there's Chief Inspector Tutsumi who is tasked with investigating a strange paranormal death. Then there's high school student Yako who wants to know the truth behind the alleged suicide of a friend. And finally, there's the bereaved housewife, Harue, who wants to use the rite of resurrection to bring back her dead son. Technically, you also get to play as a character named Mayu later into the game, but it's less a story route and more of a cool puzzle-solving escape room one-off. Personally, I like Yako's route the most out of all the main characters. It's the only route in the game that is even remotely horror-themed, having a few genuinely scary moments. Yako's storyline stays true to traditional Japanese horror conventions, focusing on building atmospheric tension and even featuring a vengeful female spirit that often dominates the J-horror genre. In the route's opening scene, Yako, with the help of her friend Mio, communicate with Michio's spirit through a game called Kokkuri-san, which is basically the Japanese version of a Ouija board. Not only does Yako receive a curse stone, but unbeknownst to her, she also becomes possessed with Michio's spirit. The rest of her route wrestles with the unnerving fact that Michio has supposedly come back to life, exacting revenge on those who had wronged her in the past. Overall, Yako's route emotionally resonated with me the most. The story revolving around Michio is heartbreaking, and I found myself sympathizing with the awful things that she's been through. That's why I think Yako is such a great character to vicariously feel all these emotions from. She's emotionally receptive and understanding to Michio's situation. She never doubted that Michio was a good person till the end, despite the bad things Michio may have been forced to do. Ultimately, it's a tragic story of abuse and neglect. But also, it's a story of what it means to be a good friend. And it highlights Yako as a friend that many of us either want and or want to be. Sadly though, I don't share the same enthusiasm with Tutsumi and Harue's routes as I did with Yako's route. For the most part, Tutsumi's route is fine, I guess. The best part of Tutsumi's route is definitely the buddy cop dynamic between him and his partner, Junior Detective Erio. I enjoyed the banter between them a lot, and I even found myself grinning at some of the dumb jokes and faces that they made. I always welcome levity in stories like this because it gives us, the players, a much needed break from all the tension and suspense that's building throughout the story. However, there is just way too much comedy in this route that it completely breaks my immersion. Most of the comic relief in the game occurs whenever Tutsumi and Erio are on screen together, and while I wholeheartedly welcomed it in the first few hours of the game, Near the end, I just couldn't take any of their scenes seriously anymore, even when the game wanted me to. Haruo's route, on the other hand, was really disappointing. I'm just being honest. It was definitely my least favorite route in the game. Haruo could have been such an interesting antagonist due to her twisted motivations of wanting to bring her son back from the dead. And we actually see a slight glimpse of this when we meet her for the first time playing as Shogo. However, when we finally get to play as her, we really don't do anything throughout the story until the end, and that kinda just sucks. Despite being a main character, Haruei takes on a very passive role in the narrative. Most of the time we spend playing as Haruei, we're talking to a private detective named Richter Kai. Now, Haruei's story is about grief, mourning, and coming to terms with the death of a loved one. And while I can totally see that as a reflection on why she isn't being proactive in the story at all, I still think they could have done a better job, telling the same story and character arc but making it less boring compared to how it is now. As it stands, she only reacts to the story unfolding around her and gets dragged around town by Richter Kai in order to progress the plot. Even then, Richter Kai is the one interacting with the characters they meet around the city, and it really makes me wonder why they didn't just make Richter Kai the main character of this route instead of Harue. All in all, I enjoyed the story that Paranormicide had to offer. However, I would say that Paranormicide's greatest strengths as a visual novel doesn't come from the novel part, but instead the visual part. Personally, my favorite thing about the game is its art style, and that's high praise coming from me because if there's one thing you should know about me, it's that I'm very particular when it comes to anime and manga art. That being said, Gen Kobayashi's character art in Paranormicide is amazing and incredibly befitting of the older, more retro aesthetic that the game is going for. The art strikes a good balance of having a modern charm to it that is indicative of popular trends in anime and manga art today, while also still being rooted in realism. An interview with Kobayashi reveals that he was tasked with designing realistic characters from the 80s, so he didn't aim for anything eccentric, working instead to create ordinary people incorporating the fashion and such from the time period. 
That's why all the characters don't have physics-defying, skittles-colored hair, and instead have down-to-earth hairstyles appropriate for the time period, with most of the characters even having black hair. When was the last time you watched an anime, canonically set in Japan, where most of the characters had black hair? The game's art direction makes this historical fiction feel as real as possible, invoking the feeling that the events of this game might have actually taken place in Tokyo back in the 1980s. Building on the game's art direction, the setting and background detailing in this game is nothing short of perfection. First of all, the game being set in the late 20th century Japan creates a sense of separation from us the players in the modern 21st century. This is a deliberate choice coming from the game's director, Takanari Ishiyama, who in an interview said that, by having the game take place in the late Showa period and not in the modern Reiwa period, the game gives a mysterious impression that supernatural phenomena such as curses will be accepted with a sense of realism. This lends well with the decision to use real-life images of Tokyo in order to craft the game's backgrounds and settings, especially with the added film grain and chromatic aberration, simulating the old-timey CRT TV effect that was the norm back in the 80s. It just gives the game a believable yet classic retro aesthetic. I also thought the omnidirectional camera was a really nice touch. I felt that being able to control the camera in that way made the visual novel more immersive. Paranormicide is a well-designed period piece that uses environmental storytelling to its fullest. Not only does it portray what life was like in the late Showa period of Japan, it's even reminiscent of the earlier Edo period as well. Now, the game takes place in Sumida City, a special ward in Tokyo. However, back in the Edo period, Sumida City was known as Honjo, the same Honjo where the Seven Mysteries come from. As such, Historical context is really important in the game because it's a fictional narrative that is deeply rooted in real Japanese culture and history. Did you know that the titular seven mysteries of Honjo are based on a real collection of urban legends dating all the way back to the Edo period? These urban legends, which started as ghost stories, were collected together and named the Honjo Nanafushigi, or the Seven Wonders of Honjo. Its most famous depiction comes from an ukiyo-e artist named Utagawa Kuniteru who in the late 1800s created a series of woodblock prints depicting the Seven Wonders of Honjo. Today, the Seven Wonders of Honjo serves as a tourist attraction in Sumida City, where you can go on tours around town and read about the urban legends on maps and plaques. And the more I think about it, actually, I find it so amusing how the game was made in cooperation with the city of Sumida itself, as well as the Visit Sumida Tourism Office. Now, I just can't help but think that this game was created for the sole purpose of boosting Sumida City's tourism. By playing the game, it's indirectly telling us to go visit Sumida Ward in Tokyo, and I'm not gonna lie, it's kinda working. I've never been to Japan, but thanks to this game, I'm definitely putting Sumida City as one of the places in Japan I want to visit someday. Now, I prefaced earlier that, as a whole, I really enjoyed playing this game. However, that is not without complaint, and I think that there are a couple areas in the game which is lacking, for a lack of a better word. I felt that the few game mechanics Paranorm Sight did have were gimmicky at best. I also think that the weakest aspect of the game is in its storytelling. The game relies way too much on exposition dumps, slowing the narrative to a crawl at times. I also thought that the ending and the reveal of the mastermind to be lackluster and anticlimactic. First of all, I can't be the only person who predicted Yoko to be the true mastermind from the very beginning, right? I never once thought Nejima was the mastermind, and while I had my doubts about Ayame, she was never as sus as Yoko. Yoko basically disappears from the entire game as soon as Shogo saves her, and guess what? Shogo ends up dying as a consequence. And finally, the constant fourth wall breaks being used to cover up certain plot holes really disappointed me. I'm specifically referring to the times when the game requires you to use the story chart in order to jump from character route to character route in order to progress the overall story. While I thought the novelty of the story chart was cool at first, it definitely felt like it was being misused in the latter half of the game, especially during Mayu's route in the escape room puzzle. When you reach the true ending of the game, it tries to justify why the fourth wall breaks conveniently covers up all the plot holes in the game. And while some may find that explanation to be satisfactory, with the game attempting to tie everything together neatly and give an explanation for every single thing that happened, to me, I felt that it cheapened the ending and honestly just left me more dissatisfied, leading me to wonder if getting the true ending was even worth it at all. 
Now, my criticisms might seem harsh on the surface, but it's important to understand that it's okay to be critical of the things you like. I may not have enjoyed the ending, and there may have been things about the game that rubbed me the wrong way, but that's only a small fraction of the time I spent playing and enjoying the game. Like I said earlier before, Paranormal Sight was a great experience. In the end, it's not just about how a story ends, it's about the journey before the destination that matters most. Thank you for watching.